I do believe very strongly in cultural memory mm -hmm. uh, as being a vital force and that we can capture, this is just an aside, but we can capture and help the young people recapture cultural memory mm -hmm. uh, through storytelling of how things are in the world. Welcome to the Maven Parent Podcast. We have a special guest with us today. And uh, I was actually thinking of different ways to open this up. And I was going to say, Ona Lee is in the house. <laughs> I thought, number one, that's pretty dated, you know. But number two, it's actually literal because she's in her house right she's now. This in is our house. Our house. These are, our house is our professional studio. Our kitchen table. Well, let me tell you about Ona Lee. She... Uh, was l married to the late Bill McGraw. She is, so she's a wife, she's a mom, she's a grandma. She can tell us more about that. She did a uh, bachelor's degree at Whittier College here in Southern California and then did an MA and a PhD at Georgetown University. Okay, now that's just the start. And then, I mean, this gets pretty, pretty cool. In well, the 80s. Well, tell what she did her degrees. The MA and the PhD was in uh, political science. Political science. Political, and political theory. Political theory. Yeah. So, yeah, we may, we may just get off on a whole conversation <laughs> about politics. So, um, but in the 80s, uh, Ona Lee was uh, appointed by President Ronald Reagan. You served two terms on the National Council on Education Research. You've done work with the Heritage Foundation. And then in 1986, you co-founded the Education Guidance Institute. And I love the motto, right? Teaching truth, goodness, and beauty through classic movies to the rising generation. And so, uh, Ona Lee, welcome. Thank you, Brett and Aaron. Yeah, we're Thank glad so to much. have you. And uh, of course, those that that's your, you know, that's the official bio, but we really want to we want to hear your story, Ona Lee. So, yeah. I mean, tell us about where you grew up and maybe the kind of family that you were raised in, a Christian family, non-Christian family and and give us some background on your life. Okay. Um, I would say that um I was uh very typical of my day. I was uh what they call the silent generation. I grew up, I was a little girl in the post-war world, post World War II world of California mm. and uh, grew up in San Luis Obispo, California. Oh, beautiful place. And um, my, my family, I would say we were lacking in a real, we didn't have an intentional Christian way of, uh, th I think things were kind of taken for granted. Mm. Uh, the good life was kind of taken for granted. Mm. Um, so when I entered Whittier, um, I would say I, I had no particular, I, I knew God existed and I wanted to try to be a good person, but I wouldn't say that I really understood Mm -hmm. uh, what it meant. Um, and uh, my, but my life took a dramatic turn when in my junior year, I was an exchange student to Howard University. And uh, there was in the time of the early civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And my best friend, uh, Leslie, who lives in Coronado, she was an exchange student to Fisk University, and I was an exchange student to Howard University. So we were best friends. We both had a great idealism. And in that time, which was a very special time that I write about and present in my blogs and in my articles, because <clears throat> it was a time when there was a greater awareness that there had not been justice for all Americans, and in particular, injustice and discrimination with black Americans. And um, so anyway, I was privileged to be in Rankin Chapel on an amazing day when Martin Luther King himself was in that chapel. Oh, wow. And he exhorted us 
to stand up for our brothers and sisters in at Fisk who were going to the lunch counter sit-ins. Mm. And it made the difference for me in terms of what I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, be somehow involved in political things. I was a political science major. Um, and uh, although I had difficulty being studying political science, because I was much more drawn to literature and literary things, but you know how those things happen in life. You wind up in one one major or another. And mm-hmm. so it's just kind of interesting how uh, that happened. And I really didn't know that I was going to get a PhD or anything like that. I just had this sense of wanting to make a difference. I guess you could call it that. So at what point did you kind of put your faith in Christ? Was it well, that, was while you were reading Lewis? Was it with the professor? No, it actually happened in a certain way that was tied to my decision to marry my, my beloved husband, Bill. And that was that when I was going to Europe, I had saved this money, and Bill was in part providing that money because I was his secretary and he was my boss. Oh. He was a uh, uh, at that time in private practice in Washington D.C., and um, we would start talking about all these literary things and these political things and all this. And he was more of a conservative than I was. I was kind of the liberal mm-hmm. orientated, even though I had had these very seminal experiences to help me to be more settled, but I was still, my orientation was still quite liberal. And uh, anyway, Bill gave me the book, Mere Christianity, um, to read. And I remember reading it, I was sitting on the train uh, in England with my girlfriends that I traveled with. And I just fell in love with C.S. Lewis and his writing. Mm -hmm. But later when I came home, I was trying to decide whether I would should marry Bill and whether I, what could happen. And I just thought, I will reread Mere Christianity because I have to believe that Jesus is the divine son of God. He is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. He is, he is. And my Aunt Elaine, who's a wonderful evangelical Christian that I would always see growing up in the San Joaquin Valley, my dear aunt, she had been praying for me because mm-hmm. I had said to her, well, Jesus is just a, a great prophet, Aunt Elaine. I mean, you have your view and I have mine. Mm-hmm. And she had burst into tears and said she would pray for me and ask me if I'd ever heard of C.S. Lewis. So that was about two years before I was reading C.S. Lewis. Wow. So everything, I guess you guys have heard these many of these stories before. <laughs> all these things are connected, yeah. aren't they? They're all connected mm-hmm. together. Okay, so tell us about the steps that led you to work for President Reagan and serve on the National Council of Educational Research. So now, I mean, that's a big jump forward, but education starts to become something that's important to you. I'm, I'm sure it had to do with Getting married, becoming a mother, having children. Oh, my goodness. Yes, it did. Um, Well, that's, again, another piece of this because being a member of the silent generation and raising my kids, what, in 1960, in the late 60s, all right? Mm -hmm. I can tell you, my kids were little then. But that first revolution of really reducing the human person was uh, taking off in our educational philosophies, and uh, there reducing was reducing the human person to what? Because I, I think that'll intrigue people. It was reducing the human person to uh, a materialistic view Mm -hmm. and also a relativistic view that you know again uh it doesn't these things don't matter or else uh there was actually and this is 
this is getting off a little bit, but actually it's quite related now that I think of it. Mm. Um, there was a scholar named Jerome Brunner who wrote, uh, he wrote, he was the author of the series called Man, A Course of Study. Mm. And this is, this is again, the kind of thing that was in the air, just as the some years before, uh, and and Brett, you've written about culture and mm -hmm. what it is and how it it shifts and these mm -hmm. these shifts and uh, uh, that I lived that because when I was in high school in the public schools, we had a great classic curriculum, um, and that was hitting and I was in a position to judge it because of this exceptional education mm. that I had had at Howard University, mm. at Georgetown, but also at Whittier, mm. at parts of it. And um, now with your kids, you're seeing a major shift. And now, then Even it came again the because there okay. was this huge uh, backlash, Aaron, against, and that's how I landed at the Heritage Foundation. Be, and I was on the education desk, I guess you'd call it. I was an education consultant. And I wrote a little booklet called Secular Humanism and the Schools, the Issue Whose Time Has Come. And then I was able, because of my studying the political philosophy and kind of having that, I was able to do a comparison of um, I didn't call it Christianity. I called it traditional views, or so I can't mm -hmm. remember because I wanted to have it broader. Yeah, you know. But uh, it was a comparison of the Christian worldview and the uh, this modernist thing mm -hmm. of uh, the secular humanist view, and so I compared them down there and uh, through through these pages. And the booklet took off like crazy. And mm -hmm. it was right before President Reagan was elected president. It was mm -hmm. during the presidency of, of Jimmy Carter. And everybody was surprised. But again, it's in the air. Mm -hmm. Christians all over the country were trying, just as they are now, you know, mm -hmm. to try to address what's in the culture, what's happening, what... And um, so th the booklet was very popular. So you started with Heritage first, and then uh, Reagan appoints you to this. Yes, the special. yes, that's that's what happened. Okay. Yes, and you serve both terms. Yes, there, there uh, a lot of us did that were on that, and we were very proud to be able to participate. Um, mm -hmm. in, in that great time. Yeah. Yes. And so, and it's, so it's the National Council on Education Research. So you're yes. thinking through the nature of education. Yes. Right. You're thinking in, uh, uh, thinking from a, a Christian worldview. What is it? Yeah. What, what is a, what is a human being? Uh, what is the nature of education? What is age, education for? So these really big, important worldview questions. Yes. Right? right. And then and thinking through or or being consulted on, okay, and then how does how does that how does the state well, put it, this into policy? Yes. And having to hold your end of it up when the answers are not easy either. Because mm -hmm. uh, we have to try to think, well, how can we improve education? It's a very one of the most challenging subjects. Mm -hmm. So yes. And yeah. Yeah. So before we talk about connecting those dots and talking about film and how we can use film in our own lives and in our kids' lives in their education, which I'm excited to talk about with you, Annalie, I wanted talk. I wanted to ask you about this love of film that you have and when that started, and if you remember. For example, like the first time you went to a movie or the first movie you saw or even like, you know, your favorite movie when you were little, something like that. So tell us about movies and how they impacted you. 
Well, Erin, I saw It's a Wonderful Life in the theater when I was oh. seven years old. Oh. And it had this huge impact on me. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and think of that being seven years old and seeing that film on the big screen. And I can honestly tell you, this is why I do believe very strongly in cultural memory. Uh, as being a vital force and that we can capture, this is just an aside, but we can capture and help the young people recapture cultural memory mm. uh, through storytelling of how things are in the world, in the mm. culture, in the place we live, with our families, the people we love. Mm. So yeah, we don't often think about movies being a part of our cultural memory, like you're talking there about, you go. but uh, I mean, well, maybe we think about it with iconic movies, but I, I think most of us watch movies and we don't think, oh, this is going to be in my cultural memory. Well, and I think I think we're we're talking about a different era too. I mean, mm -hmm. because True. what year does It's a Wonderful Life come 1946. out? 1946. 1946, uh, and and so you've got a whole different. Uh, culture. I mean, movies. You, I'm, you went to a theater to go see this. This isn't something that came out direct to your iPhone, right, or to some streaming exactly. platform exactly. that you can simply consume in your house. So there's more of a a whole, uh, you know, uh, way of living. Yeah, of way, a people. Yeah. Thank you. And Brett. this is a community event. I mean, yes. I, so I'm just curious to hear just some of the details. So was it your your parents that took you to the movie and, um, you know, I, I just kind of that's, process that's, that with us. That's, uh, that's right. Uh, it was a community event, and I did manage to do a documentary that's on my website that oh. we can talk again about yeah. later, if you like. And that is what starts our documentary, is that I talk about going to the movies as a major community event. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to believe in today's world, but it's absolutely true. So who did you go to that movie with? I was probably there with my mother. Okay. I, I, I think so. And that is just what everybody did. And it's kind of tied in, with, we'll talk a little bit later, about the production code mm -hmm. that was in operating because uh, that code secured entertainment for a mass audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you go to this movie, you walk out of there. Yes. And it, what, what are you feeling? Well, you I'm out? just a little girl, so I can only just tell you that the memory I had, I can tell you those two memories. One is Donna Reed as the old maid at the library, right? <laughs> And I'm just looking, and oh my gosh, she doesn't know George and just doesn't know her, and just so shocked. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm seven years old. And then the other memory I have, maybe because it was, I was so grateful when George is back in Bedford Falls and not mm -hmm. Pottersville, and he says, Merry Christmas, Mr. Potter. And uh, Potter says, Merry Christmas in jail. And I, I was not bothered. I knew for sure that George was going to be okay. Again, mm -hmm. that's the power of the storytelling and that things are going to work out. Things are back in order. There's a moral order. Mm -hmm. So many years later, I, I guess I would say, just jumping ahead a little bit, the, the movies of the golden era – Unveil, depict, show that there is a moral order in the world. Mm -hmm. And our young people growing up since the time of the Internet, this is our generation. That's the young man I was speaking to on the plane today. And they don't know this mm -hmm. because we learn in culture, as you we're pointing out with John in uh, the book. Yeah. Um, uh, we learn the nature of reality and truth in our culture. 
with our people, our whoever we're with, our family, mm -hmm. our friends, our teachers. Uh, but it's more than that. It's the way of life of a people, mm -hmm. uh, which is their work they do, the way they live, um, the kinds of things that they enjoy doing, all of these things are in the movies. So, mm. Onali, you're not going to believe this, but when Brett and I got married, he had not seen It's a Wonderful Life. No, and I blame my parents. I blame my parents who they... <laughs> and when he told me he had never seen It's a Wonderful Life, and I said, do you know what I said to him? I said, let's get divorced. How do you call yourself an American? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that uh, shameful? So well, I, you know, I, I didn't really want you know. to get into my deep dark. <laughs> yeah, past. I wanted to let you know that that wrong has been corrected. He yeah, has seen it, it, it many times, and all five of and, our children have seen it. And years later, I confronted my parents <laughs> and I told them, you know, that that was a very, that was a big, huge American hole. American classic. That was a huge hole in my upbringing. You so. had no cultural memory. To I, I didn't. Of it's I a didn't. wonderful life, but now, and now he does. And and I I love the movie, and I we've know. done a, kind of a tradition at Christmas mm -hmm. with the kids. Well, actually, actually Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah. Thanksgiving weekend after Thanksgiving dinner, we'll do a, a Thanksgiving night movie, and we've done it's a wonderful life a number of years. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, so I have developed, I, I've cultivated a fondness for that movie. But that was, I mean, a spark for you. And 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 really, I mean, you've you started thinking about film in, in probably a much deeper way. But but we ended with that, and you you mentioned uh, about how movies and the theater played this role in American society, uh, in in American community life. Talk about that a little bit, because I think that's something that's foreign to us. Yes, I I will try very much to do that because, uh, again, to remember, I can say that um, one of those is a teenager. I was in the ninth grade when I was sitting in the Obispo Theater seeing Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck in Roman Holiday. And the all of America fell in love with Audrey Hepburn <laughs> all at once. And that was our culture of the time, is that these events, songs, popular songs, too, and artists, uh, singers, but really and truly the what was going on in the movies was this amazing cultural force mm -hmm. um, in terms of, uh, I think, just people that we loved and that we admired. I mean, you could say it was overboard, but it was, as we'll talk about the production code and some of these other things, um, and also what the studios, there were norms. Uh, I think you mentioned it, Brett, the, the idea that in the time of the golden age of Hollywood, which really, uh, really begins in, in the mid-30s, 1934, right on through the mid-60s. And it coincides with the time that what was known as the Motion Picture Production Code was operational. Okay, now we're, we, I want to get into that. But I just want to make an observation here because I think sometimes we, you know, in, in our culture, we develop new technologies and something gets developed, whether it's the television or the laptop or the smartphone or, you know, all these digital technologies. And we just kind of pick those things up and run with them. But I want us to see, and we've talked about this a number of times on the podcast, these, these cultural artifacts and these different kinds of technologies are not neutral, right? So, so they may not be immoral. It may not be immoral to use a smartphone or a, a, a streaming platform. But I mean, just compare back in the 1940s or 50s when a movie would come out and it would be played in theaters across the U.S. And so many people, that was the only place to go see That's the movie. Correct. And you didn't have 50 billion choices. And so much of the country would see this. And so there was this shared experience exactly. that you would have that could capture, could truly capture the imagination of the whole culture. 
and exactly and have a right. real powerful shaping influence on the culture. Whereas now you have you know fifty billion streaming platforms mm-hmm. with uh, uh, you know. 200 trillion shows and <laughs> options and there's not shared experiences. Mm-hmm. I mean, all the time friends or students I'm talking to will mention something and I'm like, I've never heard of that before. Was that on Netflix? Netflix? No, that was on, you know, something else. And, and I'm like, well, what's that? I haven't heard of that yet. And it's just, <laughs> it's impossible to keep up, but, yeah. but you can just see how even all of the options we have right now, how how there, there's a fragmentation it's that comes incredible. with that. Yeah, I think you have absolutely captured the uh, so much a deep part of what this problem is, and and pointing the way to why these films, uh, watching them together, uh, uh, either in student groups, parents and grandparents and their kids together. Uh, Uh, church youth groups, college centers, um, just every possible way you can think. Um, These films do, by their special quality of having been made in that period of time, when we did have a genuine community and a genuine shared worldview that there was a right and a wrong, that there was good and evil, and that our our goal in life is to work for the good and to oppose evil. Hmm. And so even if we're in different denominations or different, even some people not at that time, even unbelievers, or atheists or whatever, these things did not seriously impact the cultural unity that we had. Mm-hmm. And this is really shown in the movies because you can have uh, someone like a Billy Wilder who directs Double Indemnity in 1944 He's basically a a, a relativist in his worldview, uh, very cynical. And that's a wonderful story because it it shows about the production code and its power because this poor man, artistic genius though he was, he didn't know how to make that movie so that it could pass the standards of the production code. Mm -hmm. So that's being uh, very specific uh, with a particular film that shows this, but uh, also the collaborative nature of the films being made in the studios, the fact that there was this office that enforced this code that the, all the scripts had to be submitted to the production code office, and then they received a seal. I see God's providence in this because it's an incredible system <laughs> where, yes. Well, I'm, I'm just get, thinking people are listening because this might be new information. Like, they're, they're going, what? There was a code? There was a yes, code that yes. governed movie making? I didn't know anything about this code until I was two years into my project in the late 80s. <laughs> I didn't know anything. And I just happened to get this book called The Dame in the Kimono. That was the title. And I'm, I guess, what is this? And it gave the whole history of it. And briefly, what was happening. In the when the silence were coming out and the talkies were coming in, there here was another force, the spoken word here, mm-hmm. and uh, as long as the silence were going on, I, I, I guess they could get away with it. But it it was just getting to the point where the and there were local and state censorship boards. So this gives you another idea of the vibrancy of our culture uh, that in these various places, people with a Christian orientation, but the people of the Jewish faith would not be against this. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have them say, 
oh, this is terrible. These Christians are... No, there was a sense of a shared thing value. there shared that was values. at stake. That mm-hmm. was at stake. And, but some people took more time than others. Mm-hmm. And so you'd have local, you might call them busybodies or <laughs> uh, things like that. Uh, probably they went overboard sometimes. Uh, but uh, then the, the film would actually have to be censored at the local level. And so, uh, because you did have these laws that against, uh, uh, I can't remember what the morality laws of various sorts that say you can't show. Uh, uh, and so, of course, that, that means someone has to complain, but they would. Hmm. And so the studio people were tearing out their hair because they would, uh, that's where the title comes, Dame in the Kimono, because that's some frantic assistant director that has this woman she's just you know there's nothing on under the kimono and she's up there because somebody (laughs) wanted that kind of thing to be appealed to Mm. and he says what's that dame in the kimono doing up there and (laughs) (laughs) but that was it was sort of that way and um that it just seems so bizarre and Crazy yeah, today, to think today, about. in today's yes. world because exactly. the norms were still so strong in the, yeah. in the and community. it was just such a shared shared yes. values yes. that people yes. thought this yes. was right and good to yes. do that. The first paragraph said, "The sympathy of the audience will not be drawn to the side of wrongdoing, crime, evil, or sin." My goodness. Well, that I, code's just, gone. Yeah, I was going to say, I can, I mean. It's, it's basically flipped on its head now. Yeah. It's be, almost like there's a code that says, you will draw your audience yeah. towards Well, the sympathies sin, of the audience. Yeah. I mean, think yeah. about that. And yes. like how many how many movies, Yeah. The, e- the evil character, the scoundrel, the, you know, the thief, the whatever, the immoral person the is the hero. Like. Yes. They're the most likable character you're and your sympathies mm-hmm. are drawn. I mean, a classic one that I'm just thinking about is, and this is an older movie, but like Ocean's Eleven. Oh. Which actually, you know, I mean, that, that the, the original, gosh, was back in the, what was that, the 60s? Totally so obviously not. this code yeah. has disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. What happened to the code? Well, finally? it's very oh. interesting uh, how it got there and how it, how it went away. But it, uh, it got there because um, the studio people really were pretty desperate. Hmm. Uh, the 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 censorship was causing the movies to be chopped up at these local levels. So there were some people that were thinking about this, and it reached the attention of Bishop Mundelein of Chicago and a very wonderful priest named Father Daniel Lord. And there were also people in Hollywood that were sort of saying, well, we need something, but nobody knew what. Well, I like to think that Father Lord had that sense that was that same kind of thread that we have from Socrates to C.S. Lewis, a Hmm. sense of what is right, what is right, the natural law, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so Father Lord goes out to California and he writes this thing up, and it was the reception of these basic uh, kind of atheistic or secular movie moguls who were desperate and so he's presenting it, and you have his, his autobiography is play it by ear. Hmm. And uh, so he just has that as one chapter in his life. And he died uh, of lung cancer uh, in about 1956. So he was early passing away and not seeing that this was going to go in a few more years, which hmm. we can get into. But anyway... They did accept the code, but they didn't know. They accepted it. They said, we're all, we're all in for this code. 
Mm-hmm. Even though they, you know, they, my goodness, you know, the, uh, uh, will not be drawn to the... I mean, this was very heavy-duty mm-hmm. stuff, mm-hmm. and um, but they went with it, but they had no way to enforce it. Mm. So for four years, the studios just continued to crank out this same stuff, and then a- along came a woman named Mae West. She's quite a famous person mm-hmm. who was an actress, and she just put it right in the faces of the Christian audiences. And, she, you know, come up and see me sometime to Cary Grant and so forth. So there was a lot of reaction, and Christian groups were clamoring the Legion of Decency actually formed a Catholic group in big cities. This is an interesting thing when you think about the way things are today because big cities like New York City, Philadelphia, Detroit, there were these large populations of Catholic immigrant families in the churches. And so they said, well, we're going to sign this paper. And it says, we, we, we're not going to go see that movie. But there was a strong sense other Christian groups are doing these things too. But they had the way to have this petition going. Mm-hmm. Well, when you got the attention of these people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I, you, you, it's obviously a different time when you have something called the Legion of Decency. Yes. You're you're <laughs> yes. definitely talking about yes. a different time in American mm-hmm. history. And people were generally on the f- favorable to the Legion. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. That, that, that that's the whole thing. You yeah. can talk about all the time. Did we have uh, differences between Catholics and? And, and and Protestants or anything. Well, sure we did. Yeah. But people were believing in this Christian worldview, mm-hmm. yeah, which this, is much bigger, much deeper yeah. than what what divides us. Mm-hmm. Which isn't that what we're coming to see and we know. Yeah. 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 Wow. So okay. So you have this classic film study project that you've been working on, which. I want to get you. We want to get into some of the, the the details and specifics of it, but it's kind of built on this idea that uh, movies move us. They can move us to be more virtuous. They can move us to to be better people. So, why do you think that is? I mean, tell us. Uh, make the argument for you know people who are listening. Why can movies make us more virtuous? They can make us more virtuous because we have given to us by God a longing for rightness and goodness and truth and and doing the right thing. We have that written in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Romans chapter 2. And that, to me, is the heart of it so that when we are seeing the movie unfold, we are intuitively, I think, also some people have called it poetic knowledge. Some great thinkers have called it poetic knowledge. We're not studying a treatise or something like that, but we're seeing a story where our moral intuitions are... are. Uh, just deeply engaged Mm -hmm. and we're following that story and the resolution of the we're seeing characters facing evil the battle of good and evil and we're seeing those characters confronted in a way that conforms I would say, with the way God has made us inside, in our mm-hmm. hearts and in our minds and our souls. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So well, I, I, I love that, that because, you know, so often, <clears throat> because things have changed in the culture, especially in the Christian world, we are skeptical of movies and have, taking our children to movies. And rightly so. We've We've talked about specific movies and shows on this podcast that we should avoid. Yeah, Aaron won't children. even let the kids watch Veggie Tales <laughs> when they were young, right? Aaron was very strict. Oh my word! You were so, very strict, honey. So I love what you're saying, Onali, because this it's making us think 
more deeply about the art of movies and that it is an art form, just like we, we've we talked about on the podcast. We've done a whole podcast about making reading a part of your family's yes. culture. Yes. And and we want to be Christians that don't just say no to everything. We want to be parents who don't just say, no, no, no. Yeah. We want to say, yes. oh, here's beautiful art. Let's look at that. Let's take that in. And of course, literature is a different art form than than movies. And I know you're a reader because just as in our time together, you've talked about so many books you've read. So I love that you have a love for literature, but you also have a love for movies because like you said, it's the story that draws us it in. It is. And if you were to say, Aaron, where this is in the world or in the whole history of the world of art and everything, it is a literary. It's a story. It's a it's a literary sensibility, I guess you'd call it. Mm. But it's also this moral sensibility. It's one thing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's, you can't separate it. Mm-hmm. And that's what the modernist view is that you can separate all this and we know that it's all one thing it's it's we are whole persons and Mm -hmm. the integrity of our lives depends on uh, our emotions our reason our conscience our social senses Mm -hmm. our imagination our imagination So the All project, thing. yeah, I love that. So the project you're doing and, and why we wanted to let people know about what you're doing is you have a project of classic films that you want people to watch and to watch with their children, their grandchildren, yes. in as, their schools with their students. As a social learning, a social, cultural, moral engagement activity yes Mm -hmm. learning activity together social really learning but also just being together Mm -hmm. and then having the conversations yeah so so tell us a little bit about because because you have some different genres that you put together yes and and so give us maybe a taste of one of them so people can know what it is that you're offering but you could do the classic ones, or of course, I love the Jimmy Stewart one, which makes sense with your story of being seven years old and it's a wonderful life. Yes, yes. So tell us what your project offers if someone says, okay, what is it that if if I get on your website, this is what this is how this can help me okay. do this with my family. Well, they can see it on the website uh, because the uh, the different study guides, I think there's, maybe about 16 or 17 of them, I'm not sure. Um, They are in two forms. They're on Amazon. And the two forms are uh, theme-based, or in the case of the films of Jimmy Stewart, his movies. That's the only time I did that. Um, And so the theme-based, and then I have the spotlights, um, which is a different mode of it. So I could say that, that Mm -hmm. I have my favorite for right now in our country is the study guide, Liberty and Justice for All. Mm. Uh, Classic movies and the things that matter most. Okay. And, and before we go on, yes. give us the website. I'm just thinking people oh, are yes. listening right now. Give us the web, the yes. URL so that people can go and visit your website. Yes, it's educational guidance institute.com. Okay. And then when you get up there, there's going to be blogs I've given for you. And so these blogs are little articles with pictures, lots of pictures, lots of images that have to do with the different themes. Um, So I have one theme I work on very hard right now is the depolarization of our civil society, the bridging of our deep divisions in our politics. And so I generally take the same movies with the done with the themes and mix it around with that on the blog. So I do recommend readers take a look at that as well as the themes. But I have Men of the West, which is great, and we know that there's such an attack 
on our young men. Hmm. And they are being so uh, just attacked every day with uh, against their very being of hmm. how God has made them hmm. to be so, leaders uh, mm-hmm. in our world and with our their families yes. and in the world. So the Men of the West one that you mentioned is yes. called Men of the West, Classic Western Heroes and the Examined Life. And there's seven classic films yes. that you point us to, to yes. watch. And you talk about the beauty, the goodness, and the truth in these movies. Yes, and what I've d- tried to do, Aaron, um, for the parents and the teachers that would order this book mm-hmm. is that they can become a film expert like me, so to speak, <laughs> I've poured out to them, okay, what can we tell the kids about this director or this time of this film was made? And each film, as you've seen, ha- like I've given the examples of It's a Wonderful Life that you guys have talked about, but also Double Indemnity. And so each film has has kind of a little special things that make it such a great work of art Mm. and there's little stories that go with it and so forth and um and which is so great because most of us don't know the background the cultural background and the time and so even doing a little bit of work is going to help us appreciate the art it's like when we study a piece of art or when we maybe read a (laughs) classic book Charles Dickens, for example, how much more do his books come alive when you know a little bit about his story or the artist and the painting? If you know exactly. some things about the artist and then you see the art and you feel even more connected to it. And so I love this because you're helping us to appreciate the art, the film itself even more. Well, and, that, and that's just a general truth, right, about life. When you connect knowledge to things, then there's an ability to enjoy those things or quote unquote taste those things mm-hmm. in richer and deeper ways. So whether it's another human being, so, you know, I mean, our marriage, after 26 years of marriage, we'd say there's a knowledge that we gain, a uh, propositional knowledge, but also an experiential knowledge that really helps the richness of our, our marriage. Or it's a book, or it's film, or it's it's wine. We've talked about <laughs> that, you know, right, you right. you start to know, uh, learn about regions and different grapes and, and then, or classical music. I mean, it's, it, it, this is just, a, I think, a general mm-hmm. truth in life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you, yeah, you, you, you help in these guides you, you you pass on some of this knowledge of the film, right. of of the theme, the storyline, these kinds of things. So you're helping the uh, now the, the 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 guides are for maybe the, the parent or the, the grandparent and who the wants to parents and the teachers. Yes. Yeah. And then we do have um, well in the spotlights. I picked about nine of the movies that I just poured my heart out hmm. for. Um, like a homeschool co-op or a public school classroom, that's the beauty of our work here with these movies is that it can go into a, a public school classroom where a teacher, a history teacher, social studies teacher wants to share uh, his country, his or her country's heritage. These films are not uh, uh, attacks or uh, political things. Uh, in any way, shape, or form. Now, in in these discussions, are you start? Yeah, so you watch the movie with the students. They watch it on their own. Okay, they watch it on their own. Mm-hmm. Have this you ever is done in any? a classroom setting, right? That you're talking about. This is in this particular application okay. of the homeschool co-op oh, okay. setting. Other times, you could do like let's say you don't have a much, enough time mm-hmm. to do the whole film. Okay. Um, oh, that would be terrible. You want them to see the whole that, thing. I see. I agree with you. <laughs> that's <laughs> like seeing but a part of an art that's piece. That's part of the problem. It's because like reading if, a quote from a book instead of the whole thing. Now, yeah. if they meet for an hour, isn't that the usual time maybe for mm-hmm. time? So you can definitely do this in five days, five mm-hmm. classroom hours. That's a definite. 
and uh, I have these uh, spotlights that are designed for that. So you can move right along. I have that with Raisin in the Sun. It's a wonderful light. People can see it on the on the Amazon chart uh, there, uh, which ones are done with uh, the spotlight methodology. So it's taking that one movie and then doing vocabulary like the meaning of the words. This is thinking about C.S. Lewis again, and the imagination is the organ of meaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they can study what these words mean in this movie. Mm. And then they can grow in their um, vocabulary, and then they can write essays too. And that's what the kids do in this. Mm -hmm. This particular method works quite <clears throat> nicely because they see the whole film on their own. Then they come in. They're ready to go with the discussion. And so the study guides give plenty of advice plenty of ways of things, both ways. The themes, which are men of the West, men and women in love, I have that theme. Mm -hmm. uh, that one takes some thinking and strong thinking uh, and prudent thinking, uh, uh, but they do pretty well. But I have to give this little advice that high school kids, they do well with Roman Holiday and uh, and uh, Jonathan Mosier, my friend and colleague, uh, who's done this work down in Coronado, California, has successfully piloted People Will Talk, which is a great romantic comedy. Um, but it can be tricky. It can be tricky uh, because the kids are so inundated with everything about sexuality and all this. So... Uh, I just think that uh, what I tried to do in Men and Women in Love was to give the ones that, you know, you can you can t take this on and you can uh, discover what true love is. And so you you have seen. I mean, you've worked. So you've worked with modern kids. You've seen them respond Absolutely. to this because I oh. think that's some people might be thinking like, oh, can how do I how do I get a kid who's watching, I don't know, Stranger Things on Netflix and maybe the Barbie Marvel movie movies. or Marvel. Yes. How do you yes. get them interested? Are they really going to be interested in classic right. films? That's right. That's a fabulous question. And the answer is if you can get them two or three times is my idea. I don't think one is enough, mm -hmm. but you, you, you pick these really good ones mm -hmm. and uh, get some sort of setting uh, where there's a lot of good food, or, you know, there's different ways which mm -hmm. you guys are pretty good at figuring <laughs> out. I think you have a lot of, so it's all of that beautiful thing of friendship and mm -hmm. being together. So if you can get them there, um, or you can have a good homeschooling, and they can have this experience, I think what I've seen them have. They grow in confidence mm -hmm. that they can see the world with the moral vision that's there, that God wants them to find this. He's made them to, maybe I'm making, you know, too much, but I think that they get that confidence. Mm -hmm. And I think they develop an appetite for it. Yeah, that's you nice. know, it's like if you eat fast food every single day, mm -hmm. you're going to develop an uh, appetite for fast food. And that's mm -hmm. what you're going to want. And then when you try something else, like yes. a, you know, a prime New York strip steak, you, you might not have developed <laughs> yes. enough yeah. of a, an appreciation and a taste for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what we're you're saying is, hey, we're giving them this, yeah. they're tasting it, they're trying yeah. it. It's going to take a few times, but over time they can develop a taste for this. Mm -hmm. And really there's going to be something richer here in in the content of this art yes. than what you find in a lot of And isn't day. that what we, I mean, really that's the heart of education to help our kids. Of, of course, Augustine said to, or, to order our loves, but to love, we Sorry. want them to love what is good and right and true. And so in this area of film, our kids are inundated with garbage, with fast food, 
most of the time. If our kids are used to books like Diary of a Wimpy Kid, then when you first read them Robert Louis Stevenson books or Charles Dickens, they're going to say, oh, this is slow. This is da, da, da. You have to help nurture them to love Sometimes to love beautiful things because mm -hmm. they've gotten used to imitation, and and the well, sad and thing is we can we can be we can settle with imitation. We can settle with things that are not beautiful. Well, you can good. develop a taste for ugliness. Yeah, and ugly, morally ugly, as well as aesthetically ugly, mm -hmm. and that's what that's what we've done. Yeah. And so, um, well, this has been a, a great conversation, Onali. I think your your pro your project's important. Again, for those who want more information, you need to go to the uh, Education Guidance Institute, which is Education Guidance. Educational Guidance. Sorry, Educational right. Guidance Institute. That's right. And, and you have a free sample on there, isn't that right? Of We have uh, several, okay. quite a few little free samples okay. there. And they can get a genuine taste of it without having to invest in the study guides on mm -hmm. Amazon. Yeah, can that's great. always do that. It's a little more for them that's provided. But you can definitely download those, try it out, mm -hmm. and, and uh, be able to put your hard-earned dollars someplace else into maybe the refreshments for the <laughs> event or yeah, something well, I, like I that. I can totally see a family doing this over time yeah. saying, hey, once a month or once every other yeah. week, we're going to sit down, we're going to watch a classic film, we're going to make popcorn, we're going to get the candy, and you help your kid develop a taste for this. Beautiful. And what you've said, and I'm going to quote you, Onali, here, uh, you said, the greatest of the classic films presuppose a moral universe where our power to know, love, and do the good is at the center of the drama. Mm -hmm. And that's really the power of the classic film. Yeah. And so thank you for uh, sharing this with us. And uh, we think this could be a great tool for families. And, I'm and so schools. glad. Thank you. Maven exists to help the next generation know truth, pursue goodness, and create beauty for the cause of Christ. To find out more, check out maventruth.com.